which is just really not effective if anybody's ever tried it. Um, you have finasteride, which is a bit more effective, uh, but the side effects are just really severe. Like we're talking like infertility, um, or you know, like sexual side effects, like erectile dysfunction, as much as you know, like 15% of people. Um, so that's obviously terrible. And then the other, the third option is getting a hair transplant, which is just super expensive, can cost like $15,000. Um, and increasingly, research is coming out, sort of saying that that's not even uh, a long-term solution. They want, they might only last four years, whereas previously people had sort of said like, you get a hair transplant, you're good for life. Um, so that's proving to not be the case. So I talked a bit about you know the fact that traditional sort of biotech and, and um, has, has ignored hair loss, and as, as such, there's been no funding, and there's really not many traditional researchers. Because of that, there's really been sort of this big online presence that's filled the void. Um, and so what we found, um, and, and what I think you'll see if you join our Discord or anything like that, is there's a really like, flourishing, impressive community of online native researchers um, who, are, who are really smart, and we actually have been working with our traditional researchers, and, and the traditional researchers are sort of blown away by the quality of work that goes on. So, um, yeah, so the kind of repetitive here. Um, yeah, so just to add on to that, just like into how we actually operate. So, what's really cool is that the people who work with us are willing to work for hair tokens, which I don't think is true for a lot of crypto projects. Um, like the saying is like, oh, you need a project with a soul, aka you need people to care, um, which saves us a lot of money because like we've essentially we spent very little money and we've had like very strong community growth um, solely using our like our monopoly money hair tokens. Um, in the Kaplan operations, uh, it's not, it'll end up not being an monopoly money, though, we'll get to that part. Um, Kaplan operations, uh, basically everything we do is just like hyper efficient. Uh, so, like the big innovation, I'm sure you, most of you guys are familiar with crypto, is that I can send you equity as you that as I can send you a text message. So, things like the hair token is like our equity. Um, we can issue you $50 worth of hair for doing a small task force, whereas if we were like a Cayman Island or a British Virgin Island company, it would cost us like $500 to make the same transaction. Um, and you'd have to trust us that we get it. Like, whereas obviously with Ethereum, you can go on block explore and see it. Um, so yeah, so that's like the operation. And then in terms of the research stuff, how we can make it really efficient. Um, yeah, or just go. Um, I'll just go back to sec, sorry. Uh, I got you. So that's the research side for how we can be really efficient. Uh, or sorry, the operation side. On the research side, um, because like Andrew was saying, we have patients who really care. Uh, and also hair loss is much more topical, so it's not like something kind of like, like psychologically, it's not really something in your body, right? Um, people are willing to, to do things that maybe they wouldn't for other diseases. So like there are people in our community who will order drugs in Alibaba, like mix them themselves at home and apply them at, uh, apply them at home. Uh, so essentially what we've realized is the current market up and down biotech is, is really like ripe for disruption for us. Um, so like Andrew was saying, we have a ton of early stage yeah, researchers yeah. that like traditional biotech's completely ignored. On the clinical trial side, like our members would pay to be in clinical trials. The way traditional biotech works is usually big pharma pays a clinical trial placement person to like query a bunch of doctor databases and they try to find someone. We'll literally just have like a full list for them. And then public consumption, uh, the way that like current dynamics work when you're buying these hair loss products is essentially like all the money gets spent on marketing. So you're buying like Hims, Roman, uh, companies with literally zero R&D budget, but where over 100% of revenue goes towards marketing. So um, ideally, we can disrupt that and drive all that money into R&D from marketing. Um, yeah, and so then like how this is kind I'll, of- I'll just take yeah. it off there real quick. So just like an interesting thing on, on the marketing front, I think it just speaks to, to sort of how misaligned what the current hair loss market is, is that globally, there's like an annual early stage R&D spend on hair loss research of $5 million. Um, and, and Benji, who's actually the one that introduced us to Michael, actually just hit us up today. And he was like, Hims, you know, like Hims, the, the, you know, the company that's selling like uh, your, your Minoxidil, your Rogaine, all that stuff, your Finasteride. Uh, they spend $76 million per quarter on marketing. And so a big goal of ours is to, is by sort of controlling the patient community, is to really drive down marketing expenses um, and funnel a lot of that savings into longer term R&D that actually benefits patients. Um, and ultimately, will probably be, you know, probably be a lot more valuable. But it's a long-term perspective that a lot of the times these these companies like like Tim's and Roman um, don't really take. Um, and so just going into like 
how we've noticed the growth cycle kind of works. Um, but maybe just go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, actually, wait, let's just go. So just like in terms of how the growth cycle actually works, there's kind of like three types of members, if you will. They're like super passive ones. So like people who are like buying those drugs on those DTC companies, but they don't do research. They're like people who are kind of like in the channel and chime in, but they don't kind of go the whole 10 yards. And then there are people who are like, like I was saying, like literally try drugs on themselves at home. Uh, and to and like also a few traditional researchers um, who we also have on board. So essentially like the more we can get at each kind of like the more, it's kind of just like community building because like, they kind of attract each other. Um, what's really cool is like the, the product we're building with Michael. Um, there's definitely, I put it here, right here. Um, <laughs> just a little CP. But uh, essentially like uh, we can build like, so, so this product, will, what it will be is a, a patient database, we're calling it the patient portal where you'll upload your hair loss treatment data, your genome, and then photos of your head, and you'll receive hair tokens for doing so. Um, like we encrypt all, well, Mike will handle all the encryption, so yeah, if anything goes wrong, you know who to look to. But uh, so, uh, yeah, but essentially what that will do is we can then run computation on that data and find gene targets or other sorts of things, most likely just gene targets, uh, for us to run trials. So that's an example of where getting those early, like even the passive, passive patients can attract a lot more of the more uh, early stage researchers. I also just think a really cool part of this product is that there is a lot of biohacking going on, particularly in hair loss. Um, unfortunately, sort of all that data really just gets lost like through like various Discord chats and stuff. Um, and so this tool will sort of allow people who are maybe trialing something on their own to, to upload their data, upload their results. Um, and then if we actually want to take it to, to a more formal trial, um, it, our, our odds of success are just greatly improved by sort of the observational study data that we're going to be able to collect yeah. with this tool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, that's mostly it. Uh, yeah, any questions? Sorry, that was a lot of talking. Woo. Woo. crowdsourcing the patients that are going to be using the patient portal. Um, and a lot of instances, clinical trials are to be like mined through databases so that you can get a diverse population so that you're not statistically biased. How do you avoid that when all of your patients are generally coming from similar sources like you showed, like YouTube, Discord, Reddit, whatever? Yeah, so, so to your point, like the community right now is, like I would say we have like a very ethnic and global there. Like we've looked at it, it's only 25% of the US, 75% yeah. Yeah. global. Um, but it's, it's mostly all that. So we, the drugs we would do, and actually the, the treatments for male and female pattern baldness are different, um, just because like hormonally we're very different, so there's just things that we can do that, like can ask the, uh, like women can't take that, so women only have noxital. Um, but they also have like this other, there are a few other things maybe, but um, yeah, so, so that's kind of the first part, and then the second part is, it's just it's just data, but yeah, I think yeah. I think you're right, and I, it's a difficulty that we're definitely going to deal with um, is the fact that just a lot of our members are anonymous um, and and might not necessarily want to give up like their ethnicity or something like that. But I, I think ultimately um, that'll be inputs in this in this tool, and we'll we'll be able to know if we're getting you know biased data one way or the other. Um, but honestly, that's a good point, <laughs> and we should look out for that. There are tools that you can use. There's like like. Identity, on-chain identity is still like kind of pretty early. Um, on-chain identity being like where you can prove that you're a real person. Because like hypothetically, we have like 850 Discord members, but like they can all be me, hypothetically, right? Like, so um, like find a way to actually prove that you're unique while keeping the anonymous like feature for other people up is yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh uh, how much do you seek to raise and allocate for the R and D, and is it going to be sustainable? Uh, is it gonna is it gonna surpass uh, what the other major incumbents are earmarking for R and D? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't. I, I think we're gonna be way more R and D heavy than traditional incumbents, which which really isn't that hard. When, like Kim's and Roman, we're talking like near zero numbers on on actual R and D. Um, so. So yeah, and, and ultimately the way that'll be determined, I think, is is through the hair token holders. So so we haven't actually officially launched a token yet. Um, actually, in the process of, of coding the token auction, um, and so so once once that's done, we'll sort of um, we'll have the token live, and we'll we'll do sort of a one vote per token um, voting scheme where where people just get to vote on the things they want to fund most. 
Um, I think something we're going to focus on a lot early um, is sort of the products that will less less sort of investments into into various research, but more kind of the products and tools that we can use to leverage the existing data, leverage the existing community, um, and effectively kind of create like this hyper efficient machine for uh, IP generation. Um, yeah. No, 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 I'm all done. I have a question. Um, on one of your slides, uh, it's on the YouTube slide, um, where you have like different communities. All of them are obviously hair loss related, except for one. And they're down, down, more plates, more dates, yeah. which a lot of people are like steroid users. And so of course a lot of them have yeah. like baldness. But I find it impressive that you guys were able to find this community, which is not about hair loss, mm -hmm. but is one popular topic. So what are other communities like this that you're working at that might have like Hair loss, simple no messages. That's interesting. I mean, <laughs> I think we got most of them to be honest. Like, like we were, you know, someone was saying the other day that at 800, you know, well, I mean, like a lot of a lot of them were sort of Reddit communities, um, like Trustless and stuff like that. And I'm not sure. Maybe you could help us with with uh, more of those communities. But yeah, I mean, more plays, more dates. It's a pretty big. He's got like. Yeah. The thing is, we we watch we watch. We've watched like his stuff on hair loss. So yeah. that's how we kind of that's how you know. yeah. yeah. He has some like the most viewed videos. Like even though he's not a hair loss guy, his stuff gets like millions of views. So YouTube yeah. source it wasn't like some other people in your team who was like, hey, here are some other sub communities were like part of the sub yeah. We're like the whole team. Well, we well, like molecules yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the community, but yeah. full time. So yeah, so it's worth <laughs> noting that three months ago, I think, Molecule, they created BioXYZ, which is like a launch pad for BioDAOs. We were part of the first cohort, so so as part of that, they sort of they give us a grant grant funding, and they also gave us really like two full time uh, team members. One of them is a lawyer, which is super helpful, kind of navigating um, what is still a super undefined regulatory area. Um, then the other guy who's really more biotech focused. So it's it's sort of four of us at this point that are full time, and then a bunch of other people kind of jumping in. Um, yep. Sure. <laughs> so. Uh, hair loss seems like a very cool kind of niche, and then hair loss with people who are probably relatively extremely online. Um, but I can imagine that there's like not just hair, but a lot of like health and cosmetic type stuff, like I don't know, herbal supplements and vitamins and stuff. Do you see you guys branching out maybe horizontally, or maybe that's like a down the road because it's like hard enough just to do? this hair specialty, or, and then related to that horizontal, is there anyone else that's like crowdsourcing? Maybe forget blockchain, just like mm -hmm. maybe pre-clinical trial if you want to see like what people are interested in. So it's like you're getting people at malls or startups or I, I don't know. Like I just like it's it's cool. I never thought of medicine this way. I always thought of it like starting with the you know randomized control, but then this is like before all that. So right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. see besides hair, that's the, the value of death. Yeah, yeah, that's where we're trying to. Say. But. Yeah, you don't get an answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, no. I mean, I think you can you can apply this to, like any medical condition. Um, the the thing with hair, like it's like the traditional saying, right? Like, want a really underserved community. Um, so it's like finding those. Like one that I think would be cool is tinnitus, because like my ears have been ringing since I was 21. Um, <laughs> but and like there's no fun in going to that, because that's also not disease. So if anyone here wants to start that. But um, so was, your, yeah. was your question like would we would we get engaged in like Cosmos? Yeah, I remember you or did anyone else that you know of? So I think we're, we're I think we're the only ones taking this approach and we've, we've So the other uh, four the other three in the cohorts are beat it out, like you said, the other three, um Athena Dow, which is women's reproductive health. Uh, there's Valley Dow, which is less bioscience. Well it is still bioscience, but it's more like clean so energy. Like and then uh Psyda, which is psychedelic mushrooms. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But in terms of hair loss, like we're, yeah, we're the only ones. No one's like crowdsourcing. I mean, it's like private individuals at this point will say like, this looks interesting. I'll fund this study personally. Um, and what we would say is you might as well do it through us um, and get effectively like 100 eyes on it of people who are studying this stuff to, come, um, to actually DD your investment for you. Um, yeah, I saw it. Um, do you guys have plans to like monetize the research results either through like patents or like products eventually? Yeah, so, so Molecule, um, it's a little complicated, but so so Molecule created uh, BioXYZ, which is the like the the launch the launch pad that we're a part of, um, and Molecules they're in fact like an IP NFT marketplace. So they're trying. So when we generate intellectual property from our research, they want to effectively link that to an NFT, put it on chain, um, 
and by doing so, you just make uh, IP like a liquid, a liquid tradable asset, um, which theoretically should accrue value and sort of allow for more collaboration. So, I mean, I just always like, if you want to sell IP traditionally, um, just figuring out like who owns it would typically cost you like $120,000 um, before transfer. Um, so, so the IP NFT kind of takes all those costs out uh, and sort of makes it easier to actually monetize your IP or, or know what its true market value is. Um, I'm not sure if I missed this, but did you guys mention who your researchers are and labs you're working with? So, no, we, we didn't actually, which we totally <laughs> should um, uh, If you want to talk about the T3 study? Yeah, so the first study we funded um, was taking thyroid hormones, which is like one of the 10 most prescribed drugs in the US, uh, but applying it topically. So no one's ever done that before for like any dermatological condition. Um, and we're doing that with this doctor named Ralph Pass, who's at the University of Miami and also the University of Manchester in England. He's like probably the top Western hair loss researcher in the world. Um, but other than him, like, so like, he kind of has a, con he's kind of like one of like the head guy basically, but uh, there really isn't much. Like, like Andrew said, five million a year uh, globally. So to give you like, an, I think the estimated like average study is 300K. So you have like, you know, 10 of these going on globally every year. Um, and a lot of them aren't even hair loss. People like do wound healing and then try to save, like pe people try to mix and match diseases to try to fit their expertise, so. And then we have like some like hair transplant specialists who work with us, um, which is really big in terms of actually getting like the, the scalp skin organ cultures, uh, which is a real barrier to, to hair loss research. It's just a lot of people who are losing their hair don't want to then give you a, a chunk of their scalp. Um, so, so we work with a couple actually pretty big transplant guys who then also are designing studies for us. Um, and the last thing I think that's important about Ralph, um, which, which we didn't mention, but he has his own R&D lab, which in terms of creating like this hyper-efficient um, sort of like IP generation factory, uh, by going through his research lab, we're, we're able to circumvent like the traditional universities and, and tech transfer offices. Um, and so in doing that, I, I mean, in, in some cases, you literally cut the cost of uh, research by like 100%. Um, or I guess, you know, you cut it by 50%. Um, because like just the universities and TTOs are just so inefficient, they kind of price gouge you, um, or they price gouge the researchers and, and the people funding the researchers. Um, so by eliminating just, that's one of the many middle that we eliminate, but just that right there, um, and our connection with Ralph is uh, like invaluable. Updates on like the lab results we posted? Yeah. yeah, we'll post it like four months. Yeah, so we just funded it like a month ago, and we'll get initial data four to six months after funding, so. Uh, so yeah, so that was the, the grant for Molecule. Um, yeah, and little plot, I guess, yeah, so we'll probably, we'll probably do our token auction next month, if I had to guess, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be doing that, so. Why are you interested in this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we both, like, you can't really tell from, like, so we both have, like, struggled with hair loss, um, and I think, uh, just like personally experienced like how much it kind of like messes with you mentally and, and so in sort of like that personal process like this is a pretty good product I think um, just based on how badly I, I sort of wanted more hair um, and I think we talked to a bunch of friends even and it's like what would you buy first a Tesla or a new head of hair and everyone was almost like new head of hair 100% um, so we're like okay, that seems like a pretty sticky product and something that people would pay a lot you know pay a good amount for um, and this seemed like the best way to do it um, because like Ethereum blockchain in particular is sort of a chance to realign incentives and sort of more of like a less of, hair loss in my opinion has been less of a biological or technological problem um, and more of the fact that the the in industry incentives to come up with new solutions um, are just so perverted and so um, if you have uh, really patience driving capital allocation in this space I think you're uh, increasing the probability of um, pursuing true innovation rather than sort of short-term profit taking, which has been going on. And so I think over the long term, true innovation is, is ultimately sort of like the most valuable creative strategy. You guys are free advertising for your product, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. We can be before and after picks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta be on the team to get this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the inner circle stuff. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone has any more questions.
thanks so much for having us. Students to practice 
all these different things that sort of do the, uh, uh, it says people should do. And, you know, so I wanted to, you know, think about that concept. And then I also want to talk about like science fairs just more generally as a microcosm for the scientific experience in America. So science fairs play a crucial role in addressing sort of the reproducibility crisis in science, which and it provides students, and so the reproducibility crisis is, uh, refers to the inability to replicate the results of many scientific studies. So this is a big problem in science today. Like if you look at a lot of papers, a lot of things are either too complicated or just don't work. Um, the reproducibility crisis, so uh, even, so uh, this lack of reproducibility has called into question the validity of many scientific findings and has raised concerns about sort of the credibility of science as a whole. And there are many potential causes for the reproducibility crisis, including the pressure to publish, and especially in academia, the flawed statistical models, p-value hacking. Um, however, one possibility um, for potential solutions to the reproducibility crisis is to encourage sort of more open and transparent and reproducible research practices. I think we can also like lower the stakes in science today. It's so high stakes in order to get tenure and everything, people are sort of forced to publish these extreme papers, maybe p-value hack, and to get those findings so that they can get tenure or another job or something. And science fairs put a lot less pressure on people um, to sort of enjoy the process of science instead. So science fairs can be seen as a microcosm of the scientific process, and they provide students with a way to engage in the research and experimentation, and through communicating their findings and re receive feedback in sort of a very low pressure way. So because science, um, yeah. Okay, so I just want to then now make this other analogy to GitHub. So I think there's a way forward, you know, with this reproducibility crisis thing. Let's look at GitHub for as an example of how um, it is used in software development. So GitHub allows for people to post small projects that might be almost inconsequential. And it has allowed pe people for, to collaborate on software projects and have significant, and so GitHub has also just like allowed for a little project, but as a whole, GitHub has actually like accelerated the process of software development by allowing people to sort of collaborate with each other. Um, it provides tools for version control and collaboration, such as the ability to create branches and track changes, which allow developers to work in parallel, but also sort of um, work independently and alone. So GitHub has played a major role in the growth of the open source software movement by providing a platform for developers to share their code openly. I think the most important part about GitHub uh, has been, it has accelerated sort of the pace of software development and made software more robust and more composable. So in a nutshell, sort of GitHub contributes, contribution is that it doesn't necessarily change, it's not in the software of GitHub, but it sort of changed the way that, that software is developed instead. It's allowed uh, for software to be developed much more faster. So um, I kind of want to like take this step and say like, Okay, what if we were to like redesign a science fair today, like what would it look like? So in today's world, a science fair might look very different from the things that we've seen in the past. Um, it might, like for one, it should be enti held entirely online. There's no reason it needs to be in person. And it should allow for greater accessibility and participation from a wider range of people. So maybe not just people who are born in California, but people who are born around the world. Um, and the other thing is like science fairs right now are very like individual. There's just like one person, one project. There's no incentive to collaborate with each other. So uh, in a future science fair, maybe what we should do is have encourage people to collaborate as sort of part of the judging process. And this sort of uh, this approach reflects the greater need for you know cross disciplinary and cross uh, collaboration in modern science, which is sort of motivated also by that John Dewey stuff. Um, so you know the other thing is like instead of science fairs being so refocused on the on the result of the scientific question, maybe we should focus a little bit more um, on sort of the process and the reproducibility within the process. Okay, so this is all the build up to the motivation. So today I'm excited to announce that DSCIE MIC is going to hold a decentralized science fair. And <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we're launching this like DSI NYC de decentralized science fair. 
And this is really cool because it's like taking into account what we thought were all these like different things that we thought a science fair should have as part of it, right? And in some ways, this is going to be like an experiment within an experiment. So the whole the process of like decentralizing science fairs is going to be an experiment, and then we'll control contain many other smaller experiments within it. Um, it's going to uh, it'll be focused on using the blockchain and DeSci methodologies to accelerate science and to drive innovation both in the science in science, but also in the scientific process. So that's like, we, we were doing a good job on sort of the science things, but I think what's sort of lacking in some of the scientific research is the methodologies and scientific research in the processes, uh, which is causing problems like down the road in science. So um, the goals here are, the, one of the key goals of PSI is to bring together scientists and research, researchers from around the world um, to share their findings and collaborate on new projects. So we believe that leveraging the power of decentralizing technologies like the blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies, we can create a more open and inclusive scientific community and accelerate the pace of science. So another goal of the DSI Science Fair is to promote the use of open source methodologies and tools in research. And we believe that we can make scientific data and knowledge more widely available, that can help democratize the scientific process and make it more accessible. So one of the main reasons that we are launching the T-Science Fair is because we believe that the scientific process is too competitive now. It, in too many cases, scientific research is driven by narrow financial interests and pursuit of short-term goals, rather than the desire to truly understand the scientific world and the real and real-world problems. So we hope by fostering sort of a more uh, collaborative research environment, we can focus more on some of the science. And then lastly, with, with tools such as like uh, ChatGPT and GPT-3, I want to see if there maybe there's ways in which we can use AI to foster the scientific process. So we want to see how can AI be used to support uh, new types of scientific inquiry. And I think New York City is the perfect place to launch uh, a DSI science fair like this. With a diverse and vibrant scientific community and its rich historical innovation and discovery, NYC, New York City is an ideal location for this new and exciting event. Uh, we believe that by bringing together the best and the brightest minds from around the world, we can make a real difference in helping shape the way science is done. So, this is kind of how, this is like a little, so I'm going to, I want feedback later on, uh, how this is done, but, so if we wanted those certain outcomes, um, the judging is, is as follows, like, we want to reward people for their scientific, um, prompt, discovery process, their scientific questions, so what is their research statement, and that includes things like the scientific merit of their question, the impact of that, potentially have uh, the novelty within the question, but then also we want to uh, encourage innovation within the scientific process. How are they going to use uh, distributed ledger technologies to improve science or to make it more reproducible? Um, we want to encourage people to work together with other projects that may or may not be participating in the fair just more generally. Um, and then conciseness. Science is so long now, it's like you read a 10 page PDF paper, so we want to encourage people who have brevity in their thought and um, ability to communicate that. And then lastly, the execution. Does the thing do it more or less what it's supposed to do? Okay, so the timeline today is the start of the fair. You know, present at this momentous event, thank you. And then we're gonna do a couple workshops and then it'll end in the end of March. And then we'll bring everyone back together to do like an in-person demo uh, at the end of March. And there'll be like an online judging if people are online or they're not, uh, we can keep moving in real life. Um, so we'd like to ask, um, did they, did, first of all, does anyone have any questions about it? Uh, yeah. You didn't mention your target researcher. Is it like any human being? Yeah, so I, mean, I think it's like high school, college, or even existing uh, DAOs that, that exist. Um, the, we're, we're, we're going for simplicity in it. So we want, we want it to be like smaller projects as opposed to like giant projects. But I think it's still to be determined uh, the level at which I'd say like 18 to plus. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So um, you can watch this, and so you can visit more um, on our website. This is the website dow.dsf distributed science fair, and. Um, we're looking to, you know, we just started it. We're looking to uh, 
if you want to participate, you can come talk to us, or um, we have a group chat as well that we're starting to plan it in. But this will be like a big project for DSI NYC community to start building uh, a bit more like uh, interest in, in the group, sort of more globally. Yeah, uh, this is where you're all 
Awesome. We have a headphone and a mesh on. I'll post my web through crypto. Okay. And Mike's just coming from many, many areas. So I'm going to show up. That's cool. Yeah. That's it's like, so, so what is the. I just want to focus on this as soon as it is. So we do precinct today. Precinct is a mix of the crypto collections and the whole small process there.
did it for us. Uh, more like analytics. How did you start in this? Yeah. I'm sure you I'm on the mental side. Me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.